All right, perfect. So we're so uh, today we're we're gonna go ahead and uh, really get started on what I, I would like to say is the the basics of course rating. So not so much into the into the actual obstacles and evaluating each one, but just more of some of the definitions and some of the principles that will be used throughout different obstacles and different parts of the rating process. So I know we have a wide range of skill levels and experience levels on this. So if you are new, um, you know, just hang in there because uh, a lot of this will make more sense once you hear it a couple times. And uh, for those of you that have been doing this much longer than I have, um, obviously some of this is going to be review. But, um, you know, I think just again, like to, to read to, to say again, if there's any questions throughout, just let us just let us know. And I'm probably relying on some people on the call to help me answer some questions too. So, all right. So, um, I guess I guess really, but before we get into like the basics of of the of the definitions, you know, one of the things, and we talked about this last week for those of you that were able um, to make it, and that the the main reason that we that we do the uh, course rating is for golf courses to be able to use the world handicap system and for golfers to be able to post scores and use the USJ um, handicap index that that our course rating provides. So it's an important, uh, you know, the the most important service that the game provides to over 65,000 golfers across the state, kids, um, people that age like me, um, seniors, super seniors, all, all sorts of walks of life male, female, uh, from all different ethnicities. So it's an important system, but the goal of the system itself is to create an equitable, uh, or a, an equitable uh, playing environment for golfers, whether they play in Grand Rapids, Lansing, Novi, or Gaylord, or anywhere in the UP, or anywhere across the, the world now. So it's, it's important and we'll talk about this is that it's it's really important that we're adhering to what's in the guide and, and what is written and not necessarily um, based on what we think is right or how we play because we're doing this system for for you know millions of golfers across the world so we need to stick to the system and not and not go away from the system and not based on what we think is right or what you know how you play the, the uh, whole So when when you're when you're going through this and um, you know learning learning it and getting better at it, one of the things that I found most helpful is just making sure that I read everything that's in the book or really reading it when I'm going to apply an adjustment or make an evaluation on the golf course. Because sometimes if we don't read exactly what's down there, we're, we will miss some things. So that's what we'll we'll talk through a lot of these definitions here. Um, that are really kind of central to, to how we look and evaluate uh, the golf course. So a scratch player, again, when we're doing course rating, we're evaluating the golf course for the scratch player and the bogey player. So a scratch player is someone with a 0.0, .0 handicap index, and then they can hit, hit their shots these lengths. So for a male, they hit their tee shot 250, a female 210, and then on the, on the subsequent shot or the second shot or a third shot on a par five, they can hit it up to 220 for men. And then the female can hit it up to, to 190 for a scratch player. Okay. We'll talk about where that means when it hits the ground and rolls out um, on certain shots. Um, but that's that, 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 those are really important. You'll need to know that every time you go out there. Bogey player, likewise, 200 yards for a tee shot, 150 yards for the for a female, 170 subsequent shot for men, 130 for women. And then our landing zone is where we are landing, whether it's in the fairway, um, could be near the green, um, but that is an area that extends from where it hits the ground and then where it ends up. So we'll, we'll, we'll see in a later, later um, spot where basically that is going to be a 20, 20 yard window where we first hit the ground and where the ball ends up. 
and then when we're looking at things, whether it be fairway um, or really fairway or obstacles when we're in our landing zones, you want to evaluate that entire 20 yards, not just if, if, if the sheet says we go to 150, we don't just go to 150 and only look at 150. We're looking at 150 plus the 20 yards behind it where the ball first comes into the ground and rolls out. A couple other uh, things. So, carry, so when we talk about carry safely and when we talk about carrying things or crossing, whether it's water, um, extreme rough or anything, we won't see out of bounds carried typically, um, but, there, but there are examples across the, um, the world about that. But basically what we're doing is we're not necessarily carrying the, the, the water per se, we're gonna say it's 10 yards beyond where that water ends. And so we, our measuring crew will, for the majority of our carries, we'll, we'll measure this point and have it. But for some, you, you may need to, to, to do that yourself. And so I have an example here in, a little, in the next, I think next slide to show you kind of what that means and where that point is. Like, likewise, with closely boarding for our, our bunkers, um, that that's typically where we deal with that is is when we have an obstacle that's within 10 yards in any direction of the perimeter from the edge of the green. And I'll have a, sh a quick example here. Then the last kind of um, one that's similar to closely boarding is near. And we'll talk about that more specifically in the following sessions when we talk about fairway bunkers. Um, that's really the most applicable concept there but that's within 20 yards. So here's, here's a picture. And when I, when I use these pictures, I try to uh, use golf courses in Michigan so that uh, people might be familiar with it. So um, if anyone has, has played the uh, U of M course in Ann Arbor, this is, this is the 18th hole here. And um, you can see here, there's a little pin Point, and that marks where our safe carry is, and which is 10 yards beyond this, this water point. All right, so it's not necessarily we're not measuring here, we're measuring out to, to this to this point here. And then the other thing too is that I mean typically this is this is measured by our measuring crew and, and, and would be noted on your sheet or your form one. So you wouldn't necessarily need to do that. But if this was in the middle of the hole, um, you know, you might, you might need to do that yourself. We, we would also measure if it's off the tee, we, we, we would have that measurement for you as well. And here's an example. Um, I forget what golf course this is, but, and I know it's some course in Michigan. Um, good luck trying to figure out which one it is. But um, so here's one where you have bunkers that are near the green. <laughs> Um, but in order to be closely bordering the green, they need to be 10 yards. And so you see that that bunker um, that's 12 yards away, short right of the green, is not a bunker that borders the green. However, the one on the left it was, is, with, is within seven from the edge. So, so that would count. And that's really important when we start to evaluate our bunkers and, and making sure that we have the proper bunker numbers um, so that we know which bunkers are closely bordering. It also will come into play for carry adjustment potentially for certain golfers and that so, certain times carry has to be closely bordering the green um, in order to qualify as well. So um, so it, it's important and that, that that is always measured by the measuring team, but it's not necessarily noted on there. So sometimes you will, when you're out there, you'll have to ask the question or have someone step it off if there wasn't anyone from the measuring team there that remembers, is this closely bordering or not? Because it does, it does impact potentially some, some adjustments um, beyond, beyond the bunker. One, one of the uh, things with, with the course rating system and when we're out there too is that it, it, we are assuming that golfers are playing by the rules of golf so 
there'll be some terms in the quote unquote rules of golf that are in the book as well that, that we need to understand. And so penalty area is, is one of those. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar, in 2019, the rules of golf uh, changed pretty substantially. And they changed the um, terminology for a water hazard to a penalty area. And so a penalty area can be red or yellow. And the, the colors are still the same as they were, but basically it's, it's as defined here. Um, I, won't, I won't read it to you. But one of the things that we have to deal with is how there, there is a lot more flexibility now in penalty areas and how they're defined by golf courses and by the rules of golf. And so prior to 2019, it wasn't quote unquote by the rules to mark a area of heather grass as penalty area because that didn't meet the actual definition. Well, now they have loosened it um, to allow for such. So it's important for us when we're out there, and this is really on, on our team leader, or our captain, to find out you know, how the golf course is, is treating certain areas. And typically what we, what we do is if, if there are red stakes, they're definitely penalty areas. And then if there aren't red stakes, then we need to look at maybe the back of the scorecard or talk to the, to the, the golf pro to figure out how, how golfers play there. And again, at the end of the day, it's, it, it, it does need to conform with the rules. So if, for example, they put red stakes by a property line, the, that property line is out of bounds and not necessarily no, red. Not. So we, we, we would need to. The gam. Oh, I'm sorry. Rate. No, that's okay. I just joined. I didn't know. All right. Um, so, so, so it's 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 important for us to to understand that, and that 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 really lies on the captain. And if there are um, scenarios where there might be some tricky situations, the the captain will typically make that announcement prior to us going out there and, and when when they're talking to the group. Extreme rough is. So we're, so Michigan is in what the book calls a quote unquote cool season or cool season grass. And that is when there is rough and excess of six inches in length. Could also be underbrush and trees or things like sand dunes, ice plant, palmettos, desert, rocks, things of that nature. Heather, we see a lot of that um, here in, in Michigan. And the other, the, the thing about that too is that we want, we, we are evaluating when we do this, we're looking at, you know, how likely the ball is going to be lost in this area. Is it, can it be advanced from it? Can it be played out at all? If you've ever been um, in, in some heather grass, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference between heather grass, that's, heather grass that's really thick and one that's really light. There's some heather that if you hit it in, it's, it's basically a, a stroke penalty because you're not going to be able to hit out um, or if you try it you're going to take th three or four hacks to get, to, uh, get it out um, and then others it's 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 not uh, you know that very very challenging to get out because maybe they purposely thin it out or they keep it thin and then we we look at extreme rough not only in our crossing um, in lateral obstacles, but also it could also be a, a additionally rated under R&R &R or recoverability and rough. And then also in bunkers as well. Um, would the bunkers, and someone might have to help me out, would the bunkers be like if they had like the tall, like wispy grass, like on the border of the bunkers, is that kind of what they're, they're referencing there? All right, so we're going to say we're going to think that that's right, <laughs> um, unless unless I hear differently. And so then our obstacles that when we're looking at crossing again, we're looking there. These are things that we're crossing and must be carried to play the hole. We're we're looking at our penalty areas, extreme rough and out of bounds. Typically, we don't cross out of bounds. The one example that most people know about is the 17th hole or the road hole at St. Andrews, where you're literally crossing a building to play. And so that would be one example 
um, where where that that would you know you would also look at out of bounds. And then for lateral, we look at the same three things: penalty areas, extreme rough, and out of bounds. Uh, but only when they come into play laterally. And so the 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 reason, and the, this is actually a change starting, I believe, in 20, 2019, I believe, is when they changed it. But basically, the the, the reason to look at it, um, you know, separately is because previously it was it was not getting counted properly. It was maybe only getting counted once if it was water that went in front of the tee and then along the side. Um, but but also, you know, the, the the way that these obstacles come into play for a scratch golfer or a scratch player compared to a bogey player is different, right? So for, for a bogey player, crossing is much more of a challenge um, because they don't hit it as far. But for a scratch player, you know, the crossing isn't necessarily the issue. It's more of missing it left and right that comes into play because they hit it farther. And when we hit it, we, you'll see in a little bit there we'll have a little shot dispersion chart, but when we hit it farther, the ball tends to spray more, right? I mean, that's just, just how it works. And that's true for any, any type of golfer. So again, here's, here's just an example of, uh, of a um, crossing and how, you know, you might have here where you have a crossing um, where, where you have, you know, going to the green, uh, but then you might have in this picture here, maybe they play the clubhouse on the right as out of bounds. And so you'd have not only a crossing number to carry the water, but also a lateral number to this out of bounds. To, to evaluate, or it could be behind the green as, as well. All right, next uh, couple definitions. So effective plane length, and uh, we, we, we don't um, necessarily deal a ton with this. I mean, obviously we, we, we evaluate these things, but the actual effective plane length number that's spit out at the end of the day is really done behind the scenes in the program that, that we put all of our data in. But essentially what it is, is it's the actual plane length of the golf course, taking into consideration um, the fact that maybe the ball doesn't roll as far because it's heading into an uphill slope. Uh, if we have to lay up because of a crossing for water or maybe it's a dog leg and we can't hit our full shot length that we talked about earlier, the, the uh, 250 and 200 and the 210 and, and 150. Maybe we can't hit it that far because of a dog leg. So we'll, we'll take that in consideration. And then elevation is also worked in as well. But the elevation is, is typically, that's, that's something that we gather, the measuring team gathers, and that's a, a T to green um, evaluation. And we'll, we'll talk more about topography in a, in a future session where we actually do that when we're looking at topography, we look at elevation as well. And then the because because the system is is designed for you know all, all across the world, there is a sea level and elevation component. But luckily in in, in our state, we don't have to worry about that because we're uh, underneath the um, elevation requirement for us to have to make any adjustments. And if you I, I mean some people kind of maybe don't understand why that's the case. If you've ever played golf in Colorado, um, you know that elevation makes a difference um, because your ball goes goes farther. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, and then the other, so one of the things we talked about were layups. So there's, there's two different types of layups. We have a force layup, which is when a severe obstacle or a combination of severe obstacles such as penalty areas, um, deep bunkers, extreme rough, or severe topography crosses the fairway or reduces the fairway width in the normal landing zone of the scratch or bogey player to less than 15 yards or 13 yards for a bogey for a female player. And as a result, the player will hit less than a full shot. So it's important to keep in mind that, I mean, this could be like a creek running through the middle of the fairway where we have to lay up, um, but it could also be a really narrow area where the landing zone is less than 15 yards or 13 yards for ladies. And so when you're out there filling out your sheet, 
And I see this sometimes, I'll see a, a fairway width of 11 on your sheet, but then there's no, there's no layup. Well, you can't have a fairway width of 11 um, because by definition, that would be a required forced layup. Um, so there, there, there are things we have to, you know, think about when we're, when we're, when we're making this, this, this application. And then we have a layup by choice, which we don't use a ton, uh, but that occurs when a significant obstacle or a combination of obstacles near the normal landing zone results in a scratch or bogey player choosing to hit less than a full shot. In a fairway landing zone of 15 or 13 yards for female yards wide, but without severe obstacles may be a reason for layup, um, may, may be a reason for a layup by choice. And the layup by choice would be also employed um, primarily by scratch players in their course management decisions. So it's not to say that it doesn't apply to bogey players, but it's very rare that it does. And the situation would have to be fair, you know, very, very severe in order for that to happen. And that's what that last statement says that in order to qualify in general, the, the normal landings almost present an unpleasant situation, downhill stance to an elevated green or something along those lines. So there are, I mean, there, there, like I said, we don't, we don't do this a ton. Um, and when we do, it's mostly geared at the um, scratch player, but you know, there, 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 there could be a scenario where it might come into play. And um, one that, you know, it's that I've run into, we had, uh, we were raiding Bailey farms up in uh, the Traverse city area. And there was a, I think it was a par five, I don't remember exactly, but basically there was in front of the green, there was this, you know, 30 foot, 20 foot deep kind of crevice that didn't have water, but it was just kind of hollowed out. Um, and so that that's a good example where, you know, maybe, maybe the golfer doesn't necessarily, yes, they can hit it forward, um, but the fact that they may end up on a downhill eye hitting to an uphill green, um, would be not not practical, and then instead they would just lay up the 20 yards and then hit their shot to the green, hit hit their wedge shot. What what we're not taking into account for layup, and what we don't what we don't want is when someone says, "Well, I, I lay up by choice because I like to hit a 100 yard wedge shot into the green instead of a 50 yard shot." Well, there there has to be a reason that you would do that. If there's nothing. If there's no significant obstacle there, then there's no way that you can lay up by choice. There has to be some significant obstacle in order to even consider doing a layup by choice. All right. Uh, mounds, so mounds and rise and drop were uh, slightly altered, but um, not 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 for this year. So for those of you who've been doing this, it, nothing's changed, but it has changed in the last uh, year or two. And basically, um, you know, the, the uh, definitions itself here, I'm, I won't read them out. But basically, one of the things that has that has changed is that before it was it would had to be either mounds or rise and drop. Now we can evaluate them and possibly together they can they can account for an adjustment. So maybe it doesn't quite meet the five feet for the rise and drop, or maybe it doesn't quite meet a significant portion for rise and drop, but combined between rise and drop and mounds, it would be enough for an adjustment. So that's something that, that can happen now uh, with, with the 2020 changes that were made. But really, again, we're, we're looking at mounds and in, in, in rise and drop, typically around the green, but we can also look at mounds in the fairway landing zone as well. Um, and then also, any if, if there are mounds in the, in the actual fairway, those would be evaluated under topography. And so we, we're also looking at, well, I think one of the things that, that, we, that we do across the state is we, we also evaluate what you know what type of chip shot that you're going to have around the greens and so you know typically downhill chip shots are are, are challenging much more than, than an uphill chip shot and so we take that into consideration 
when potentially putting in a adjustment here under mounds or rise and drop. All right. Uh, I want to pause a minute and see if there's any questions, uh, if anyone has about, about anything we talked about so far. Kyle, I had a question. Um, sure. In under extreme rough, we were um, discounting one, two, or three last year, and there seemed to be confu confusion as to what was one and what was two and what was three, you know, by percentage or number that you would take off. Can you clarify that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that so that percentage, um, we're, we're actually we're actually going to talk about that. I think in a in a couple of slides. Um, but 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 we'll definitely use that example because it it is it is a um, you know tough thing to to kind of evaluate. But 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 we'll uh, talk about that shortly. Okay, so then I had one more question. Sure. Um, about the forced layup versus uh, chosen layup. Mm -hmm. um, if if you're saying that if it's between if it's under 15 or 13 yards, it has to be a forced layup, and then. In the next section where it says play up by choice, it says if it's 15 under 15 or 13 yards, it, you know, but there's not any other penalty areas. I mean, nothing around it that would keep you from hitting it. It doesn't have to be. So uh, how, I mean, so then you could have an 11 yard wide fairway without having a layup, right? Because if there's no other penalty, I mean, if there's no other problems around it, then you could still have that. Yeah, so I think I think you're right because I think I I misspoke because I think I missed the first part here where it says and I'm just looking reading myself. So it occurs when when a severe obstacle or a combination of severe obstacles um, reduces the fairway. So so you're right. So if so 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 that statement I made earlier was incorrect. So if you had just narrow you had a narrow fairway of 11 yards and it was rough on both sides with no bunkers or anything like that. It would not be a forced layup, but if you had those bunkers on left and right, it 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 would be. Is that correct, Mark? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Um, when there is a narrow fairway and less than 15, 13, when there's nothing lateral of that landing zone or near the landing zone, the fairway width is what it will less than 20, and generally gets a very high number. And in fairways, we're also encouraged to use a W minus because the rough in those areas tends to be easy to recover from. So just because there's a narrow fairway doesn't get you a forced layup. It's got to be something that's appropriate that would cause somebody to think twice about wanting to be in the uh, areas that were lateral of the landing zone or near the landing zone. So it's not an automatic right i'll lay up when you have an arrow fairway yeah yeah no thank, thanks for thanks patty for pointing that out that was uh my fault i misspoke there yeah so there needs to be something a a, a, a severe obstacle or or a, a combination of things to to uh, make that mandatory can i say something really quickly sure i think the biggest difference is a forced layup adds yardage to the hole a layup by choice does not. Both add yardage to the approach shot, but the forced layup actually adds playing length. Correct, correct. Yeah, Bob, that's a, that's a great uh, point in that when we're, when we're filling out our form, if it's a, a forced layup, we're putting a number down in that layup cat or in that layup box. But if it's a layup by choice, we don't, we don't put a number in there but we do, like you said, Bob, adjust the approach shot length. Um, so that, that, that is a very important point. All right. So uh, the, the, the next, uh, couple of definitions here we'll, we'll have some some examples uh, when we did this last time we had this uh, note about C and interpretation sections in the course rating manual that uh, 
didn't exist yet or wasn't uh, wasn't given to us. Um, so now 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 we have some examples of what what they're talking about. Um, but a, a couple of definitions here. Well, you can punitive is not super important, but um, it's basically when we're talking about a shot that's going to cost or a recovery shot that's likely to cost the player a stroke. And so it needs to be unusually difficult, as it says. You'll see the term significant in there uh, in multiple situations, whether that's topography, trees, um, carry, carries, you know, et cetera. Um, and we'll show you a couple examples of what of, of what that significant term means. There's also a concept that we use called toggling, where we might alternate between rating values. Um, and there are a couple examples of when we, we would do that. Um, it could be when we're doing mounds. Um, and then uh, uh, some of the toggling too, that we, the, the quote unquote toggling that we do is, would be done by a, a measurement team potentially as well. Um, and then probably what you'll run into um, most in terms of on this page is this concept of a tweener. And that's when you have a value that falls between two values on the table. So if the table has a four and a six, but not a five, you could have a tweener and make it a five. And we do this quite a bit on trees for, for two, two or more shot holes. So here's, and I know it's a little, a little blurry, um, but here, here are a couple examples of what you know significant is and, and what it means. So I'll, I'll read them um, just to go through. But so the, the qualification required for a carry adjustment to be applied to a fairway bunker or a greenside bunker now includes the word significant. For the fairway bunker, it must be a significant bunker as judged by its difficulty factors, size, depth, placement, length of carry, et cetera, in order for a carry adjustment to apply. Greenside bunkers must protect a significant portion of the green. This means that a bunker that is in the front middle of a green but protects less than 50% of the green may qualify for a carry adjustment. The rating team should consider evidence of hole locations in determining the bunker if the bunker protects a significant portion of the green. If there are several instances where it is not obvious that a carry adjustment should be applied, it is recommended that the toggle concept be used. Another example, um, when we're talking about laying up by choice requires that a significant obstacle or a combination of obstacles near the landing zone exists. If the fairway width is 18 yards and there is benign rough on both sides of the fairway, no layup by choice should be applied. If the 18 wide fairway is closely bordered by deep bunkers or lateral obstacles, it will be appropriate for the rating team to apply the layup by choice process. And the last example here, other obstacles, including topography and trees, use significant in the rating tables. The progression of difficulty factors is this continuum, minor, moderate, significant, extreme. And it may be helpful to keep in mind that throughout the course rating system, significant refers to obstacle difficulty that falls between moderate and, and extreme. I'm not really sure what the USGA was getting at when they said that one. Um, but basically, I think what they're what they're trying to say on that last example is that when we are talking about you know significant, just to kind of think about that term on a, on a scale um, when they go from minor to moderate to significant to extreme. Kyle, I'm going to jump in real quick. We did have a, a quick question: um, Is the course rating system manual the same as what we use on the course? Uh, that's a good question. So, so the uh, manual is, is not the same. Um, the course rating guide is the is the one that that we use um, on the course. This this manual is um, something that USGA produces. That's just a a, a, a digital document. Um, as of right now, the USGA um, does not want us sharing it with everyone uh, for whatever reason, but. We're working on getting them to be a little bit more open with possibly making this available to everyone, but our, our team leaders and our captains do have this. And then we're also able to reference it in our um, you know, presentations and, and training as well. So, here, so here's, here, here's an example of, of, of significant here. So we have a a hole here where we're playing towards where the red arrow is. And um, 
we have a bunker that is protecting, you know, the green. And in, in this case here, we have, I try to draw like arrows where the edges of the green were, because it might be a little bit difficult to see. But in this case here, you know, we, we have, we, we have an ability to, to determine whether that part is, is, is significant um, or, or, or whether that carry would be significant. And really, I mean, we can't, we can't really say just from looking at this photo um, because we also need to consider you know, where, where, where the whole locations are. There could be a part of that green that we're looking at that is completely um, you know, not, not available for a whole location. And if that was the case, it might knock out a certain part of the green where you wouldn't count it. So it's, it, it's important to remember when we're out there that when we're trying to determine uh, significant, at least in this case, um, that, that it's not necessarily always, always measurement. We have to look at where, where they're putting the holes. And a lot of times it's very easy to see the, the old hole plugs out there. So I think if I remember correctly, if I am keeping my, I think on this one, we did say that it was significant and we had a, a carry adjustment for, for the bunker. Okay, and then our uh, tweeners and toggling. Um, so again, we'll start with the tweener. So a tweener example, a bogey player has a full tee shot with a penalty area about 29 yards from the center or centre. Um, it's so that that's another thing I didn't mention at the beginning. Uh, when they when they do write this book, and you'll see it in your course rating guide as well. It's written in international English, so you'll see uh, color or cent or center spelled wrong. Um, at least to me, it's wrong, but um, to other people in Australia and the UK, it's right. So uh, 29 yards from the center of the fairway landing zone, based on lateral distance of 29, the value would be a five. But the rating team discusses that if the penalty area was 30 yards away, a change of only one yard, the table value would be three. Assuming there are no conditions that make the penalty area more or less likely to come into play, the rating team decides that a tweener value of four best represents this, this rating value. That, that, that could be one example of, of a tweener. Like I said earlier, the most common example you would see a tweener is on trees, where, where we have um, basically values for on a two shot hole, two, four, six, and eight, I believe to start off. And so we typically do a lot of tweeners on trees. Um, so they might be somewhere between minor and moderate and not necessarily uh, one, or, one or the other. And that also goes into, um, you know, it can also go the other way too. So on trees, uh, one that we'll commonly run into is a par four that has, you know, two trees on it. And yes, they're on there, so we have to acknowledge it, but it's not quite up to the value of a two because the trees that are out there don't really come into play. So in that case, we would go from a two down to a one and use that um, as, as a tweener. Some uh, toggling examples here. So uh, again, some of these will be done on the, uh, from our measuring crew. So the first two grains of a golf course could both be classified as either relatively fat or moderately contoured. In an effort to reflect the average, the rating team agreed to identify the first grain as flat, relatively flat, and the second as moderately contoured. Um, this one here, this next one here will be more, um, you know, one that we more use during the rating process. So a golf course has moderate mounting, bordering many of its grains on the first of these holes the rating team uh, could, could not get to a consensus on whether to apply the mounds adjustment. And ultimately the team agrees to apply the adjustment in this case, but not apply it on the next similar situation. And then continue to use that same concept throughout the rating. So now on the rates that I've been on personally, um, this, this happens quite a bit. And it's something that I, don't, I wouldn't say it's, it might, might happen every rate. Um, if, if not every rate close to it. And then this, this last example here, I won't read it, um, but that, that's another kind of measuring team um, adjustment. So 
And then the last, the last point I think is important. And I know that's one of the goals of our, of our team leaders is uh, to make sure that we are being consistent across all teams, whether that's, you know, teams that are working on the same golf course, but also teams that are working in different areas of the state. And so we want to make sure that we're using the same similar procedures across all, all of Michigan. And we want the ones that we're using in Michigan to be the exact same that they're using across, you know, the United States, because we have, you know, tons of golfers that go and play elsewhere as well and post their scores and use the handicap system to do that. So we, we can't obviously control what, what the other states are doing, but by adhering to the rules and the guide as, as strictly as possible, that allows us to be in, in, in line or at least doing our part to uh, be in line. All right, there are uh, a couple more definitions here. And uh, so the shoot, we won't get into this, but um, until we talk more specifically about trees at a later date, but um, shoot, shoot is a, a tree evaluation and there's a, there's a good uh, explanation and table on that on page 35, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. On this next one here, obstacle squeeze occurs when there's lateral obstacles that are present on both sides of the landing zone and a player cannot play away from either side. So rating values and tables assume the existence of some obstacle squeeze um, but the upward adjustment of those table values is warranted when obstacle squeeze consists of lateral obstacles that are situated on both sides of a landing zone and are less than 40 yards apart. The bunkers on both sides of the landing zone that are less than 30 yards apart also qualify for an upward adjustment. So in this next uh, picture here, oops, did I, there it is. So here we've got a a situation where we have a obstacle squeeze adjustment because we have between the two bunkers, they're 29 yards there. So I'm not sure why the, it's 13, no, it's 13 and 16 from the center. So you basically have 29 yards. In this case, you'd have a obstacle squeeze. Kyle, if I could just bump in here just a second, yeah. this is Mark. Yeah. And, and to be a, a to be a squeeze under any of the obstacles, that squeeze must be in the landing zone, not near the landing zone. So specifically, it's got to be within that 20-yard landing zone area. Correct. Yeah, that's that's a good 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 point. So in this in this picture here it would be that that would be our landing zone, not uh, as Mark said near it. So either before the the twenty or after the twenty. Um, wait, uh, we won't we don't deal with a ton of waste areas, but it's in there. Um, so I won't I won't read it to you. Um, but 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 we do come into um, it, it does come into play in a few a few areas. Uh, what, one thing that I think, at least I know when I first started, I had a ton of questions about because when I, uh, this, this definition of tier, I, I often think of, you know, tier in a, maybe a golfer's perspective and not necessarily from a definition course rating perspective. So, um, you know, when, when you're out there and you're on a green, our measuring team is going to evaluate if there's a tier or not. Uh, that doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't be looking for them. Um, because they do, they do come into play on more than just the green evaluation, um, also on our green target. But before you jump in and um, you know be be a, a young whippersnapper like me in this process and try to challenge what's a tier and what's not, uh, and make sure you know what what the definition of a tier is. And so it needs to have two distinct plateaus, um, each with available hole locations. Right, so it can't just be a little spot that they never put the hole up there. And then it also needs to be separated by a two foot or greater elevation difference. And so, you know, two feet is, is fairly tall when you, when you think about it. So the, 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 uh, to, in order to be a tier by definition for Porsche rating, remember it needs to be two feet or greater. And then the, also the elevation um, must be include a significant portion of the green. Again, area where there's going to be a ton of holes. So you might have a little, you know, <clears throat> table-sized 
elevated tiered area, but if the whole location is only up there once every you know, week or once every month, then it's not really gonna qualify for a tier. All right, and then there's a few others um, we, we won't go into, but again, um, you know, there, there are, because we do this for, for multiple areas, um, we, we um, the USGA also has a desert rating process as well. Uh, we don't deal with that here. And then uh, it also, we talked about this earlier, but our grasses are cool grasses um, as opposed to maybe some Bermuda or warmer, glass, warmer grasses that you would see in Florida or other southeastern climates. And then our mid-season that we, that we rate in is um, April to October. However, when we're doing our rating process at the beginning and the ends of those timeframes, we often ask the golf course to get information about what mid-season play is typically like. So in your June to August timeframe. So we're not necessarily in October looking at the, you know, some of the, tr or, uh, some of the leaves that may have fell out or maybe they've, um, you know, lessened out the heather or so so when we're doing courses in some kind of the quote unquote shoulder season in Michigan, we do ask the course to make sure that these areas heather specifically, that it is it always like this or is it thin, is it thick, so that we get a true reading of what mid-season play is. And then uh, line of play is another definition in there. Again, just to keep keep in mind with line of play that it is the the way that the hole is is intended to be played. Um, so from you know down the middle of the fairway, and also that in some cases if you do have um, dog legs where you're cutting excuse me where you're cutting corners, um, you know the line of play may be different for a, a a bogey player compared to a scratch player because of the way that they're or the distance that they hit the ball. Not, not often does this happen, but sometimes it does. So at the very beginning, we talked about um, you know, the, 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 the shot distances. And then this uh, table here in section three, just again, talks about that and all the, the distance after how many shots. The other thing that it mentions too is the, the amount of roll. And so again, we assume that our landing zone is 20 yards wide and it's going to hit the ground 20 yards back from where it ends up. So our golfer, our scratch male golfer is going to carry the ball 230 and roll out to get to that 250. And same for the, for the bogey golfer, just different numbers. So when we're looking at our landing zone, we might be in a, let's see if I can draw here. So we might be at this spot right here, but our actual where it hits the ground is back here. So we're looking at this entire area here when we're, oops, when we're evaluating our um, landing zone. All right, and then uh, accuracy pattern. So again, this, this next table, and it's in your guide, but there's also a visual that's, I think, better that's not in the guide, unfortunately, but is in the manual that will show you. And this gives a dimension of the areas um, for the scratch and bogey player as expected to hit shots of various lengths, 67% of the time or two thirds of the time. And it's used to assist in evaluating the effect of obstacles around the target. So here, here's a, a visual of kind of what that is. And um, as, as you can see, and obviously I'm sure, you know, if you, if you do play golf, um, and I hope, I hope most of you do, um, it is that as you hit the ball farther, obviously the shot is getting, you know, potentially farther left and farther right, um, farther short, farther long as well. So there, there are these, 
the, these ranges or these patterns that, that, that are out there based on data that the USGA has collected uh, over many, many years. And we, and we use that as part, part uh, of a process in evaluating you know, how, how likely it is for obstacles to come into play. Um, and then also how, how penal, you know, they might be. So you might have a, a tree that is, you know, near the edge of the fairway, maybe 10 yards away from it. And if it's a tee shot, then obviously that tree is going to come into play because our, our tee shots have a wider range of, of, um, dispersion, I guess is probably the best, best term to use. And likewise, if you have a 50 yard shot, you know, you can see that in, in, in that, in those cases, you know, there's going to be very, very low stray off, off of the target. And so we might not necessarily apply an adjustment or we might not rate something as, as, um, you know, significant or um, as, as moderate as, as, as we might normally do if, if it was if it was a longer shot. So do we have uh, it looks like someone Rick do you have a do you have a question? It looks like you raised your hand. Yeah Pat, it, does this apply to uh, all uh, holes that have maybe dog legs? Um, how, how do we overlay this in essence is my question to all holes. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and I, I think this you know th this is something that we're we're not necessarily um, you know thinking about or, or using all the time per se. It it, it really it really just is is comes in on, on a few um, you know situations where we're really looking at how how much certain obstacle might come into play. So like a tree or it might be an adjustment possibly around the green. So an example I always like to use for, for this or when I think about it personally is that if I am if I have a 30 yard shot into the green, you know, if there, if there is um, a penalty area that's 28 yards to the left, I mean, it, the likelihood of my ball getting there is, you know, maybe it's left and over the green is, is really low. And so I'm going to use what we'll talk about here in a sec, a, a percentage adjustment to percentage that down because it's not going to come into play as much for that golfer for that specific approach shot length. And so if you have, I guess to get then another example kind of on your question about dog legs and stuff, I mean, that would be, if you're thinking about it there, if you're not hitting that full shot, you know, you would just kind of work your way down this, this accuracy chart. But, you know, I don't, I, it, this is, this is something that honestly is, um, I, I would say is something that don't worry about really at all until you understand um, the basics of the course rating and have, I would say a year or two under your belt um, because there's, there are a lot more important things to get right before we start worrying about this. But as you get more experienced in, in rating um, I think this this is definitely something to, to get more information about. Kyle, if I could add something to that as well. Sure. The uh, this accuracy table is meant just to give you a, a guide that on average a female scratch player hits the ball 190 yards in the air with 20 yards of roll. But Based on his accuracy chart, we can see that her depth is plus or minus 15 yards. So she may hit it 175 and roll out. She might hit it um, that same 200 yards or 205 yards and roll out to 215 or so. So it's just an opportunity for you to take a look at the rationale of the averages, knowing that on occasion, There'll, there'll be a player that can hit it longer, and on average, uh, they may hit it shorter. The reason that that deviation is there is because a scratch-playing woman might be 18 years old, she might be 12 years old, she might be 60 or 75, and they're all going to hit it a different varying length. So, But on average, for scratch-playing women, 
The average is 190 in the air, rolling out to 210, irrespective of the age or other skills and ability. They needed an average. So the deviation chart just um, shows that there are possibilities, either shorter or longer than that. Is that does that add clarity? Yeah, that, 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 that's helpful for me, for sure, and I'm sure for, for others to, to understand this a little better. So pre appreciate that, Mark. All right, uh, re really quickly, obstacles that don't or that do not exist. So in order for an obstacle to exist, it needs to be within 50 yards of the line of play. Um, but we do we do have a few examples of where we still might have a value for for something, even if that doesn't come into play um, on our specific landing zone or, or situation that we're looking at. So bunkers is, is a common one where you have a fairway bunker um, that might not be in play in your landing zone, but it is on play on the golf course. And if there's no greenside bunkers, we're going to give our bunkers a value of one for both players, bogey and scratch, even if it's not necessarily in our area, because we have to agree that along the line of play, within 50 yards of line of play, there is a fairway bunker on that hole. But again, that would only do that if there are no greenside bunkers, as you know, for those of you that have done this before. Another example here is a golf course where um, we have our tees that are back here in this area, in this area, and the hole is up this way. We're playing here. And we have this penalty area here that we pass by, we fly by on our tee shots and really is kind of an afterthought. And when we were rating it, we actually most, uh, I think everyone missed it until after the fact, I think Mark uh, caught it. But basically this is still within 50 yards of our tee shot. So it's still going to get a lateral value of one, even though when we were out in our fairway and at the green, the out of bounds here to the right um, was more than 50 yards, but we're still gonna have a lateral value of one because it does exist on the line of play of the hole. But we did have a T in this example here, we had a T that was right here that the course is putting up here. So in this case, the water is behind the player so we would not have a value of one for that for that player uh, or that T, but for here and all these other T's we do. All right, and there's a situation where players cannot complete the hole. We won't spend uh, much time at all on this because uh, I want to get the percentage before we end today. But there is a procedure um, to handle that if it happens. It doesn't happen that often, maybe once or twice a year. And uh, we'll talk more about this. I really want to get to um, – we'll, we'll, we'll cover this. Here, but I really want to get to – I guess when we talk about obstacles and we'll get into the obstacles more, but we're looking at a value and you can, you can see um, all these adjustments and obstacles um, in, in your guide, but an obstacle, a rating of zero should be assigned when it doesn't exist, which you just talked about. There are a few examples when we would put a one in, but typically on, on average, you have a range of zero to 10, but on average, a three, a value of three, four or five would be expected about half the time on an average golf course. Obviously, if it's more challenging, you might have higher numbers, less challenging, you'd have, you'd have lower numbers. And when we put a rating value of 10 on the, on the sheet, that should happen on less than 1% of the holes that we do. There are a couple examples where a rating can't be zero um, and that the system will reject that number. And then again, we're, we're rating this under the assumption that we're playing under the rules of golf. So the last thing that we'll talk about today is, you know, we'll keep it brief, um, is this weighting and percentage adjustment that Patty was asking about earlier. Um, so sometimes an obstacle such as topography is not uniform throughout the landing zone. Uh, part of the landing zone has a minor stance while um, well, 
the uh, rest is significantly awkward. And these situations do not rate for the most severe condition. Instead, determine a weighted average of the varying conditions and apply the average to the rating table. Or rate the various conditions and take a weighted average. For example, if three-fourths of the fairway landing zone has minor stance problems with the green 10 feet uphill, rated a two, and one-fourth of the fairway landing zone has significantly awkward stance problems with 20 feet uphill, rated six, a rating value of three would be appropriate. So that's a good example of where you'd have a weighting um, adjustment. This percentage adjustment it is what Patty was talking about earlier with extreme rough and values of what we like to say one, two, or three. But basically they're, they're, they're increments of 25%. And this could be applied to force carries, uh, laterals, um, Near, near, near landing zones or greens. And so a way to, to think about this and the way that I typically um, like to think about it is if I am, um, so here, here we have, a, we, here we have a crossing. Um, so we're gonna have two, let's just call it 100 yard crossings. And this one here, we're literally carrying the water on our entire shop. And on this next one here, our 100 yard crossing we're really only carrying a small part of the creek there. And so when we're looking at a percentage adjustment, we're looking at the percentage of time where we might be able to recover. So in this case here, there's definitely a percentage of time where I'm gonna hit that shot and I might not even be in the water and I'll easily be able to recover. So in this case here, let's say that this value was a three and this value we had on paper as a three because it's still 100 yards. We might P minus this one down to a two, down to a one, whatever whatever we think would be appropriate. And again, that percentage adjustment down is really looking at how how likely recovery is from that from that position. So obviously, Kyle, the other the, uh, this is Mark again. The other thing to think about is that the table value is just as you've indicated there. It's for the, from if this is a tee shot, it's from your teeing ground to fully carry safely that particular penalty area with the penalty area existing from the teeing ground to that safe landing point. So that's the table value. And if that's three, that's fully taking advantage of that. If there's only a partial crossing of 20 or 30 yards at the end of that, 100 yards, you've got an area to miss the shot short of that. That's where you should be uh, uh, adjusting with a P minus application. But my point is the table value signifies the full carry. Right, correct. Yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah, so, so we're, we're, we're assuming, like Mark said, full carry um, or in, in, a, in another case, it could be, you know, we're, we're basically, if, if it was lateral, we're assuming complete non-recovery. Non um, so imagine that, the, that this, was, this picture here was, was lateral to the hole. If you hit the ball in this water here, you know, there's zero chance that you're going get, to get the ball out of there, right? I mean, there's just, there's no way. Um, but instead of it being water, maybe it's, um, you know, tall grass or extreme rough in the example that Patty used. In that case, you might be able to advance it out. Um, so in that case, you would, you know, you, you would potentially put a percentage minus adjustment in that scenario where you have the option or the ability to play it out some percentage of the time. Kyle? Yeah. Um, I guess my question was, is one 25%, two 50%, and three 75%? Because people were getting that confused last year. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that, so I think that they, the USGA, that was one of the changes they made in 2020 was to kind of think about the percentages and in 25% increments. Um, and, and I think, you know, for, for some people that may, I, I think they, they tried to do that to make it easier for people to understand. And maybe for people that were understood it before, um, it really maybe made it more challenging to, to quantify in terms of percentage because like, like you have an example of a number three 
well, you can't really take, you know, what's 50% of three. I mean, that's not a value you can put down. It's, it's, it's 1.5. So there, there's, there's obviously some, some kind of, you know, manual adjustment, not necessarily strictly 25, 50. That's just kind of one way to, to think about it. And typically that would, you know, I, I don't know, Mark, if you have any, anything else or any other way to think about that. Yeah, the, uh, I think the important concept, as it was explained to me at the uh, uh, calibration seminar, is you think about the percentages in reverse order. If you've got this penalty area lateral and the grass is wispy and your opportunity to recover is either full recovery or 75% recovery, you probably would simply recognize that penalty area with a one or D minus, minus, minus. If you're able to recover out of that penalty area and it's a little more dense and you think that you'll be able to recover to a 50% portion, then you probably are looking at a P minus, minus. If it's seriously dense and your recovery is either a pitch out or maybe just 25% of what your full recovery would be, then you would reduce the chart value by maybe only a B minus, possibly not at all. So the percentages are actually in reverse order. 75 to 100% full recovery, about a 50% recovery then coming back with fewer P minuses. And if you're wedging out, you're only applying no P minuses or one P minuses. Like I just say one more time for clarity, the percentages are in reverse order. Yeah, that's a, that's the that's a, a great way to explain it. Um, Patty, does that does that make a little? Does that, that no, no, no. What I'm saying is, if you're putting P one, is that just a P minus? Yeah, yeah. Why, why would you do P minus 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 on a P one? That's just backwards. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think I, I think the way to think, yeah. So, I mean, a a quote unquote p p p one would be the twenty five percent, and you would and you would, you know, that would be that, that adjustment. Yeah, that's what makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. But I was getting the reverse last year. No, yeah. So if, if I'm you, sorry. If, you're you're absolutely right. I said it wrong. That if you're recovering fully to seventy five percent, that's a p minus one. 50% might be a P minus two. And if you're wedging out P minus three, I forgive me, I said it wrong. Okay, I'm like totally confused. Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, I think, I think we're at, I'm thinking the same thing. I think, I think Mark, you said it right. And I think Patty, uh, Patty's question was so, so, so basically, like if it's, if you, if you write P minus on a P minus one or P one, you're, you're basically assuming that you're only going to be able to cover 25% of the time. And if you put two, then you're assuming that you're recovering 50. And if you put three, then you're, you're assuming that you're recovering 75% of the time or seven. Well, I think it's the, no, I think it's just the opposite. It's the opposite of that, Kyle. I agree. I think it's the opposite of that. It's 25% recovery. You're going to reduce the table number by half. That would be a minus two. That means it's it's easier. Correct. Use the table number. Yes, I. And I apologize. As I said, the first time I went through it, I made an error and reversed that. I I, I actually didn't use the reverse concept. So, Patty's right. Uh, I think I heard Lori there too, and I heard Gene, Mark Erickson, indicate that if you're limited to a twenty-five percent recovery that's p minus 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 right if you're able to recover recover fully or at least 75 percent you might have a uh, just a p minus um maybe maybe uh whatever you know so you're am i saying that wrong again i i don't i don't i think I, so I'm getting, I'm getting i'm getting a mix up so, so so let's just say for simplicity we have a value of six because that's divisible by a lot of different things. So if we have a value of six, if I put P minus on it, I'm taking that down to a five, maybe. 
if I put P minus minus, I'm putting it down. If I put P2, I'm putting it down to a three. If I put P minus minus or three minuses, then it might, it's going down to a one or a two. That's the way I understand it. I don't know how you want to explain it or what you put. Yeah, I would I agree think. with that, Kyle, because the, the more you minus it, the, the easier the recovery is. Correct. Yep. yep. So uh, the, at least no, the more like, you minus it, the harder the recovery. Right. No, no, no. The more you minus it, the easier it is to recover. That's what I just said. I know that's what you said. Mark. Okay. <laughs> this is not, this oh, is not rocket right. science. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, think about it just in any other thing. Anytime we apply an adjustment and we put a minus, it makes it makes it easier. Right. Like, the more the more minuses you have, the easier the shot is, and the, okay. and the lower the value is going to be. But I think I think Mark Mark Baltima's way of thinking about it in terms of percentage of being able to recover is the right way to think about it, and just making sure that the more minuses you put on the sheet means the lower the number is going to be and the easier it is to play out of. I okay, think that also, makes sense. As you're looking at that, you know, when you, I, I think Mark was right the first time he said it, you know, and I think we've, we've clarified it now, but the other thing you have to look at also in there is, is that while it, some of these areas are easy to hit out of, you know, to recover, provided you can find your golf ball. So if there's areas within that sporadically where you could literally not be able to find your ball, you have to consider that, I think, as well in, in in this whole scenario, so. Yeah. That's an excellent point because we had a number of courses this past summer who that had the long fescue and long rough and stuff. And in some areas it was easy and other areas it was very dense and you were losing balls. So that definitely has to be considered. If you're losing a ball, you're, you're not having easy recovery. I mean, you're stroking distance. Right. Yeah, I, my point is, I think you just have to consider all of that before you just say, well, if I was right here, I could easily recover from this. But 15 feet away, if you were there, you couldn't. So you just have to be careful how liberally you apply those things and just try to get to a good average there when you're doing it. Right, yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and the other thing too, to, to, to you know, again, just to add to that is that, you know, just, just because you have an area that's not a pond, you know, that, that doesn't mean that you automatically P minus it. I mean, there are plenty of situations where you hit into some heather grass that it is like Lori said, it's going to be a lost ball. Or even if you do find it, you're going to have to hit a hero shot to get anywhere, to just, just to get it out of it. And so in that case, you know, you, 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 you would probably not P minus it at all. Um, or, or, you know, you definitely wouldn't. So it, it's not necessarily that, hey, if it's not at the bottom of the pond, you're, I'm going to P minus it. There, there are things you have to look at. And as Mark said, too, you have to look at the entire, you know, consistency of it and not just one specific spot. You and I guess if there were a lot of holes with any type of situation. You, yeah, you might have bunkers to carry or other things that would come into play that if you were only going to get 75% recovery, that's not going to work for you. You're right. All right. Um, so I think the last thing I had here is just this obstacles and then we'll be done. Um, the obstacles behind the green. So when we are looking at things that are behind the green, we severely discount them. Um, and, and just from a stats perspective, less than 10% of approach shots will finish over the green. Um, and then there's also anything that's beyond the green, we would um, apply a B minus adjustment um, and then probably a P minus adjustment as well because of the, the likelihood of it coming into play is, is low. So basically, you know, unless it's really, really severe um, and something's over the green, we're, we're always going to discount it. And, and typically, when we run into these things, um, usually um, obstacles that are lateral will, will um, win the day anyways when we're evaluating um, things. So... All right, well, that's, that's all I had planned for today. Um, appreciate everyone joining and um, glad that we were able to have some good discussion. So um, we'll, we'll stay on if there's any questions after the fact, um, but I think next week we'll, we'll plan on uh, getting, getting into the obstacles. 
and uh, just just going through those and we'll probably uh, you know definitely talk more about form ones and for those of you that are new uh, we're, we're, we're working on a, a new training or a new person or a rookie kind of training presentation where you can ask some more questions um, and, and and get get more acclimated to some of the things we're talking about so we're hoping to have a date for that sometime in the next uh, in the next week and have have something scheduled it, it probably won't it won't be next week but it'll be um, sometime early, early February, we'll, where we'll do that. So, yep, just appreciate everyone taking your time today to join us. And like I said, we'll stick around if you have any questions and uh, we'll hopefully see some of you next week. And we, we are uh, recording these and putting them up on YouTube as well. So if you can't make it for a week or whatever, you'll always be able to, to view it after and listen to it after.